Hello everyone, welcome again to the channel. Today I want to highlight um, a specific part about the recent visit of uh, Turkey to Ukraine. So as you know, the Turkish president was there in Lvov and he was talking with the uh, president uh, Zelensky but there was also a meeting with some Turkish ministers, so some Turkish officials. So they signed a memorandum of understanding that will see the Turkey, see Turkey involved in helping to rebuild Ukrainian infrastructure after the conflict ended. And um, they said that a joint working group will be created to attract Turkish investment and develop specific projects. And apparently Zelensky said the visit of the president of Turkey to Ukraine is a powerful message of support from such a powerful country. And uh, I think this is, um, my opinion about this is um, I already mentioned before when there was this um, meeting in, in Switzerland that they were talking about the reconstruction of uh, Ukraine and it was very bizarre, uh, almost out of this world, this uh, strange... Um, they even had a map that included the entirety of Ukraine as if uh, it was uh, part of Ukraine, which is not. Already the facts on the ground don't support this, so I previously highlighted the fact that uh, I consider um, a little bit out of uh, reality this attitude of uh, Zelensky trying to secure contracts with all kinds of countries. Uh, I think recently there was even a meeting in Germany about the same topic. They were talking about the reconstruction of Ukraine. They already even have a budget of uh, several hundred million euros to reconstruct Ukraine, but they haven't decided to sit and talk about peace. So they continue to extend the war, they continue to extend the conflict, but they are talking about reconstruction and they seem to think that they, there will be something to reconstruct. But uh, repeatedly, the um, president of Ukraine has uh, refused to negotiate and he has repeatedly said that he will not negotiate unless the Russian army leaves the entirety of the territory and he was also saying that he wants uh, Crimea back and um, this is just fantasy and it's uh, a dangerous fantasy because people are dying every day because of this fantasy and it's not just fantasy, it's uh, completely unrealistic um, militarily it's impossible like I said before in previous episodes um, the Ukrainian army has not won a single battle since the conflict started and uh, the army is getting weaker by the day, not not stronger. And we will mention a few things uh, during this episode that will support this fact, but I already mentioned it before, that uh, even according to Ukrainian sources, um, the casualties in Ukraine is about a thousand every day, including people that are dead or injured, so a thousand a day is more than any country can sustain. So I don't know, I think it is uh, completely unrealistic and uh, just plainly bizarre talking and trying to make contracts about the reconstruction when probably there won't be a, a Ukraine when this conflict ended. So that's uh, just... Uh, it makes more sense to me to sit and negotiate for peace rather than meet with Turkey and talk about the reconstruction of Ukraine. It's just um, nonsensical in my opinion. And they mention also in this article that since the invasion uh, in February there has been an inflow of Russian citizens to Turkey 
from oligarchs and their yachts to regular citizens and growing by bilateral trade with Moscow, sparked with, by Western sanctions. And um, I just always think that all these US sanctions are very stupid. But anyway, the Turkish official says that um, Turkey policy is to continue playing the mediator role, though they acknowledge that Ankara deals towards Ukraine in its sympathies. Bear in mind that this is the opinion of Turkish officials. There was never an official statement because I even saw some people complaining about um, Erdogan being a double face. Uh, uh, there's, uh, there isn't such a thing. This is just the opinion of some Turkish officials who, they, who didn't even want to give their names. So this is uh, an official, official information. You know, it makes no sense. Just the opinion of some guys in the government. That's all it is, you know. <clears throat> so let's continue with the stories. This is very interesting. I already mentioned something about this. Uh, is about North Korea and how North Korea has been increasingly cooperating with uh, Russia and vice versa. As you know, both countries had agreed to um, to see some workers and engineers from North Korea helping in the, the reconstruction of Donetsk and Lugansk. And of course, this makes sense now given the current political uh, world situation. Russia is seeking new partners and recently apparently the uh, North Korea and Russia had agreed to expand their comprehensive and constructive bilateral, bilateral relations with common efforts. And then this article mentions the um, historical um, relations with Soviet Union and North Korea. And I just want to highlight that uh, they're saying there is no longer any benefit for Russia in cooperating with the US on, North, on the North Korean issue. I agree with that. And they highlight also the fact that when America demanded another sanctions resolution against North Korea at the United Nations Security Council earlier this year, both Russia and China veto for the first time in 15 years. So it is a sign of the world we live in. Russia is likely to deepen its military and economic ties with North Korea, primarily because of its strategic and political worth. So yeah, it's... Uh, makes sense. Um, like I said in previous episodes, now the masks are off, the masks were removed, and now everyone can see the European Union and all the Western allies for what they really are, the bullies that they always were, but they pretended that they were doing everything out of good intentions, but now everyone can see it. China can see it, Russia can see it, the whole world can see it. So there is a lot of, uh, how to say, reactions uh, against uh, the behavior of all these countries and they don't seem to care about it. Moving on to the next story is um, this declaration from Prime Minister Viktor Orban from Hungary. So he's giving some uh, interesting points. He says uh, the deadly conflict in Ukraine has the potential to demonstratively put an end to Western hegemony globally. And that's, uh, that's already happening. So he says that he expects the European Union to emerge weaker in the global arena once the fighting in Ukraine is over. Even now, it's already weaker by their own uh, actions, actually. The West is incapable of winning the conflict militarily. 
and sanctions that uh, have been imposed on Russia have failed to destabilize it. To make matters worse, uh, the punitive measures have spectacularly backfired on the EU. That's absolutely true. He says a large part of the world is clearly not getting behind the US when it comes to Ukraine. He pointed to the Chinese, Indians, Brazilian, South Africa, the Arab world, Africa, and so these, all these regions, they are not supporting the Western line on the conflict. That's absolutely true. He says China had previously been at the mercy of the Arabs, but it's not anymore. Apparently referring to the oil market and um, this is important because I already mentioned this before. He says the other beneficiaries um, are big American corporations and he pointed out um, profits doubling for Exxon, quadrupling for Chevron and increasing sixfold for ConocoPhillips. And that's just um, energy companies, but all the companies that are selling the weapons, you know, they're also profiting. Yeah. These big corporations, um, they always profit. If wars are lost, they profit. If wars are won, they profit. They never lose, you know. These are the real beneficiaries of all these uh, situations in the world. So, this is a complementary article from a different source uh, about some of the topics that um, Victor Orban mentioned. So, this article is from antiwar.com. It's wrote uh, uh, by Ted Snyder. So, he says the continuing isolation of Russia and he mentions uh, that President Biden announced that Russia was isolated from the world more than it has ever been. He said, we're shocking off Russia's access to technology that will sap its economic strength and weaken its military for years to come. However, it is um, very different, so all those are just uh, empty rhetoric uh, statements. As we, as we know, um, President Biden went to Saudi Arabia to ask for some more oil and in the end, the Saudis increased their oil production by 100,000 barrels per day. And uh, they, they say that some analysts consider that in, an insult to President Biden. Um, I read some of the analysis about this and it was said that the Saudis have a plan to increase their oil production. Um, but they will increase it by about uh, two or three million. Um, but it will take like three or four years to do it. So I don't see it as particularly aimed at, uh, I don't know, creating some kind of insult for the US. It just, it's not in their interest. Remember that um, the Saudis uh, form part of the OPEC and this OPEC was created to be a defense against the interest of the West. So why will they give up all this um, leverage that they have now with this uh, OPEC and the OPEC plus uh, group just to give a pleasure to one country? They wouldn't do it. And besides, the Saudis don't have the, how to say, power to make these decisions. That's why they have this organization, OPEC. So they, they cannot just decide, oh, we're going to do this because that's what uh, the group was for, you know, to together decide how, how much they're going to increase. And the purpose of the OPEC is to make the price of the oil stay steady and benefit the countries that are part of the OPEC. So it is like that, you know, I don't think it was a particularly a decision to insult anybody, you know, but that's the interpretation of the person who wrote this article. And the second one, they say Biden asked for help isolating Russia and Saudi Arabia seemingly sided with Russia. 
that is probably true, but it's uh, partially for the same reason that uh, Russia is part of the OPEC plus, so they have more reasons to cooperate with Russia uh, than to help them isolate it. And they mentioned the fact that Saudi Arabia has more than double its imports of Russian oil. And Saudi Arabia and China are discussing paying for Saudi oil in yuans as well as dollars. So this is also interesting. Uh, not directly related to Russia, but uh, it says that um, Saudi Arabia is willing to trade not in US dollars, so this is kind of weakening the petrodollar. And this phenomena where Saudi Arabia is importing Russian oil is just purely economical because Russia is selling this uh, the oil at a discount. So for Saudi Arabia is more profitable to import Russian oil than to use their own oil so they can sell it without a profit you know and they buy it at a discount from russia so it's a interesting situation there china's imports of russian oil rose um, so they already have a record high and they already uh, overtook uh, saudi arabia as china's larger supplier india also helped um, also now Russia is the second largest supplier of crude oil to India so that is uh, very significant and they say China and India alone uh, have balanced Western sanctions on Russia but increasing imports by about the same amount as the West have decreased them and that is only China and India but they found many more uh, additional customers including, of course, Saudi Arabia and a few others in the Asia region. So this has been a win for Russian economy. They're not losing. And they also mentioned the fact about the exports. They say that many countries are including, uh, um, are increasing their exports to Russia. They mentioned China, Turkey, and of course turkey has always been a very good partner with russia and i already mentioned this in previous episode turkey is increasingly engaging in trade and tourism with russia imports of russian oil uh, account for almost half of turkey's energy requirements and they also import gas and uh, as you know recently there was um agreement where Russia is helping Turkey build its first nuclear power plant. So this is only increasing and Turkey is playing its cards very well. They are very smart, I think. They don't see a reason to antagonize Russia. After all, it's uh, in the neighborhood. And as far as uh, being isolated, they say much of the world has declined to join the US-led sanctions. That's exactly what uh, Mr. Orban said. And they mentioned here also BRICS, which of course is a big uh, international organization that uh, is mainly led by Russia and China. And they recently announced that they are going to increase the membership. You know, so Turkey, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Argentina, Iran, they want to be part of it. Indonesia has been invited to some of the BRIC uh, summits. And also Indonesia invited uh, Putin to the G20 summit, even though the United States told them not to do it. They didn't care and they went ahead and did it anyway. And other countries, including Kazakhstan, Egypt, Nigeria, Senegal, and Thailand, are also attending some BRICS meetings. So this is expanding, expanding greatly, um, because I think, like I said before, since the masks are off, now all the countries seem to align somewhere else far away from the Western powers, which have been 
not uh, very helpful in helping their economy, so they want to find prosperity somewhere else. As we know, Iran has also been accepted in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Saudi Arabia, Egypt and Qatar were recently admitted. Uh, Bahrain, Maldives uh, also are, are participating. Azerbaijan and Armenia are also participating. The United Arab Emirates also wants to participate. And as we know, much of Latin America and Africa have refused to join the sanctions. And then we see the reaction of the U.S. You know, the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, Linda Thomas Greenfield, told African countries that they they should uh, not engage with Russia because if they engage with them, they will have sanctions taken against them. So this is exactly the attitude of the West. This is uh, the bullying attitude of them. So no country wants to be bullied, no one, no country wants to be told what to do. So that's why they're, you know, again, grouping and uh, getting together against them. This is uh, just um, something that, in my opinion, has an uh, irreversible course. I don't think this will ever change again. And this article from Politico, I thought it was going to support exactly my point that I mentioned, the fact that the Ukrainian army is getting weaker every time. As time goes by, you know, it's getting weaker and weaker. And this article says that Europe's powers gave Ukraine no new military pledges in, U in July. And they actually say that military support for Ukraine has been decreasing since April. And they're just talking about Europe. So they mention the countries that are um, being, let's say, um, considered for this study is UK, France, Germany, Spain, Italy, and Poland. And uh, so they, they didn't increase their commitment. They actually um, decreased. And they mention the fact that European powers are not keeping up with the military aid coming from the U.S. And they say this that I already mentioned, European military aid commitments for Ukraine have been on a downward trend since the end of April. So it's not important for them, even though they talk about it, they, they don't support it with facts. Former Estonian defense chief Rijo Terrazas, now a European Parliament member, said Europe needs to wake up, arguing there will be no peace until victory against Russia. Well, there will not be victory against Russia, in my opinion, and this is a very well-informed opinion. So they are losing. They are losing as a bloc, they are losing as... Um, antagonist uh, force against uh, Russia, against China, against all of the world, you know, because the European powers are, you know, just uh, neo-colonialist powers. They don't want to see countries succeed, countries prosper. It's just, uh, they never change, you know. And I hope that uh, people can see this for what it is. It's just uh, plainly evident. And lastly, I wanted to mention this uh, particular news that um, some people have tried to make it like a big deal. But even this article from Business Insider says the U.S. has been quietly giving Ukraine radar hunting missiles that could really be a problem for Russia. Not really. They are not going to be a problem for Russia. Of course, every weapon is going to cause damage. You know, I'm not saying it's uh, insignificant, but I'm saying that it's not going to change things in a um, significant way. That's uh, even they acknowledge it here. But I will highlight some points about this particular kind of um, 
missile they are sending to Ukraine that is called um, HARM or High Speed Anti-Radiation Missile. It's a special kind of missile that um, is taking the um, signals that come from radars and is using this uh, signal to find the source and destroy it. So in theory, they will be able to pinpoint the position of uh, defense uh, systems or um, any kind of counter counter battery radars, and they will they should be able to destroy them. But they say Ukraine's advantage is likely to be temporary as the Russian military adapts, and that's exactly what it will happen. Um, now remember that um, Russia has a superior military um, capabilities compared to Ukraine and the fact that these missiles are fired from aircraft makes things even worse because uh, Ukraine has uh, uh, almost no, no air force. You know, they, it was almost completely destroyed in the first days of the military operation. So what they can do is very little. It is said that uh, Ukraine uh, flies about three or four sorties a day. So they don't have a lot of uh, aircraft. Russia is uh, flying around 300 sorties a day, according to some sources. So you can see the difference. Besides um, the radar system or air defense systems, uh, they don't um, operate in isolation. So even if they were able to shoot some missiles, you know, this missile will be detected by some other systems and it will be shut down. So the impact will be very small. They say that um, there were some reports of radar busting missiles in Ukraine in early August, and uh, the Pentagon confirmed it. That's kind of the essence of the story, but um, that not really very effective. Just pay attention to the specifications. They say harm is a powerful weapon, but it's not a new one. It was first deployed in 1983, and the 14-foot, 800-pound missile has a range of 30 miles, and a top speed of Mach 2. 30 miles is nothing, nothing really. It's uh, absolutely uh, not very significant. Uh, actually, some um, artillery has a longer range than 30 miles. So this is making things uh, difficult because the aircraft that fires these uh, missiles is going to have some difficulty finding appropriate targets because the range is so limited. 30 miles is almost uh, insignificant. You know, 30 miles won't be able to put the um, airplane into range of the defense uh, systems. And uh, let's remember that these kind of um, missiles are supposed to be used in combination with uh, some other operations. So yes, uh, shooting for shooting and try to harm a specific uh, radar battery, but there is no follow-up. There is nothing coming after that. So maybe they will be able to take out the battery. But that doesn't change the fact that uh, there is no, um, how to say, advantage. There is no way that uh, a battle can be won just by using these missiles. They are not um, launching an offensive. So these missiles are supposed to be used in combination with other military action, not just in isolation. So they say um, its 30 mile range means it can be launched beyond the range of many anti-aircraft weapons. That's not correct. 
because if we take into consideration, for example, the S300 or S400 that Russia has, the S400 and S300 has hundreds of miles range. So 30 mile range beyond the range of anti-aircraft weapons, that's absolutely not correct. Maybe Western, Western uh, anti-aircraft weapons, but not Russian ones. So that's why I was saying that it's almost useless, you know, 30 mile is nothing in the big context of things, you know. They even acknowledge anti-radiation missiles are not wonder weapons, but they can be highly useful on la launch prior to an airstrike. They can suppress air defenses, a clear, a safe path for friendly aircraft. But they don't have enough aircraft to mount an airstrike, so... What are they going to do with that? No, it's just uh, not going to change anything in the bigger context. They even acknowledge in Ukraine anti-radiation missiles will likely have a very limited impact. Ukraine doesn't have enough modern planes. Shutting down Russian air defense radar will necessarily translate into more success for Ukrainian aircraft. So there you go. Even the person who wrote this article acknowledges this uh, fact. So just put all the information together, even all the information that I just gave you in this episode. And you see where the trend is going. You know, the trend is going to Ukraine's army being weaker every time, every month, every week, every day. So the war is being lost. They cannot uh, win. And that's the situation, you know, that's where the conflict is going. So let me know what you think about it. And um, I want to remind you about the opportunity to help me support my work. In the description of every episode, I include information about different platforms you can use to support my work as content creator with donations. If you want to, you can also support me by liking sharing the episode in social media or subscribing. I hope to see you again very soon. Thank you for watching.